Hello, race fans. Doug Bowles here with you on another episode of our Behind the Bricks. We are closing in on May and the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500 presented by GameBridge. And obviously, we kick things off with the GMR Grand Prix on the road course. We can't wait to host fans here for the Indianapolis 500 this year. Last year, as you all know, was a challenge. We didn't get to host anybody, wanted to stay safe. We've come up with a plan, I think, to keep uh, keep us all safe here, but get some folks back to the Speedway as we lead into May. You know, in 2016, one of the really cool things that we did is we engaged the Arts Council of Indianapolis to really reach out to a lot of the talented folks who live in and around the Indianapolis area who make a living uh, creating art, the stuff that makes us happy. And we had an opportunity to see it all over downtown. And we've done that every year since. And just like those years previously, since 2016, we're doing the same thing. And Welcome race fans is the theme. And it's been a lot of fun to see how people take those powerful words and then turn them into magic uh, through their artistic work. This year though, we're trying to do it a little bit different, a little bit uh, in the digital format. So I'm gonna be joined today by a handful of those artists and you're gonna see their art around Indianapolis who are helping us celebrate the month of May and certainly welcome race fans here in Indianapolis. I'm joined first by Randy Fry. Randy is, an art uh, professor at Franklin, and she's come up with some really interesting artwork that touches on what makes the Indianapolis Motor Speedway sp so special, which is our history and tradition, but then evolving it to today and how in order to keep this institution moving forward, we have to constantly change. Randy, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you being here. How much fun was it to take Welcome Race Fans and turn it into the digital art that you created? Oh, it was great. I loved it. It was really fun. It was a challenge, but um, it was exciting to uh, see it in motion. So what made you settle on sort of the evolution of the Indianapolis 500, starting with 1911, all the way up through today, and really touching on some of the important topics of the day, especially around our race for equality and change and how you work that into uh, your moments in your in your artwork? Well, first off, the, the evolution of the cars, how they've changed uh, in those 100 plus years has been, um, it's, it's exciting to see it. And so I wanted to capture uh, the, the transformation of those, of those cars. And then it was just, um, it was really exciting to be a part of the, a part of the race for uh, equality and change. I, I um, wanted to make sure to include women. So, uh, you know, I think in 1930, I put a, a female driver on there just because it's, it's fun to see those, uh, those uh, uh, dresses and outfits um, that, they, that they would have wear, worn. And, um, and then uh, more, current, more current drivers um, that, that I could include that would um, you know, speak to everybody. It, it, it would um, um, be able to capture everybody and make them feel like they're part of this um, exciting race. You know, it was fun to watch watch your artwork and just how the motion that you've that you've created in it. So it it reminded me a little bit of obviously the race is about motion, but then how that race started in 1911 and just the motion of change over time. And you did incorporate that well. Did you immediately know that was what you were going to do, or how how do you come up with an idea and how did it evolve to where it ended? <laughs> um, I I th thought of several ideas, but. Um, I liked the idea of being able to see the cars transform from one into the next. And um, I, I was glad because originally it started out as a five uh, second GIF, uh, but I wanted it to um, evolve. And luckily the, the parameter was changed so that we had uh, 30 seconds to get the whole animation in because it would have been really challenging to fit all, uh, I think six cars that I, I think there's a seventh car that passes the other direction, but it would have been a challenge to fit all six cars in five seconds. So um, as I got more and more into the process, I was really thankful that the, uh, the time limit had been extended and um, and then it allowed me to not just put in uh, the, the transformation of the cars, but also um, highlight certain aspects of, you get to see the, the city line, you get to see um, the all the um, great details at the track, the tower, uh, the trophy. Then um, I wanted to also hit upon the, the town of Speedway and was able to put some um, fans in the background. So it was exciting to be able to um, to include a lot of different aspects from from the area. Well, it was it was really fun to watch, and it it, it kept you uh, engaged as you watched that evolution happen. And you did capture our history and tradition really well, as well as uh, the challenges that we're all facing to continue to be better citizens in this community, uh, to reach out to others and get others engaged in 
in our sport. So really, really appreciate your help. My final question for you, and I'll probably ask this for everybody. So did you start as an artist in the digital medium or did you start somewhere else? And you also have to figure out how to transform your art from sort of static uh, traditional art into this moving uh, digital medium. Uh, yeah, no, I, um, <laughs> I did not. I started out as a, a graphic design major in um, undergraduate and then illustration major in graduate school and, um, and have just uh, developed my skills to, to put that kind of 2D static work into motion. Um, and particularly with this piece, I uh, uh, bought an iPad Pro so I could um, do the drawings with a digital pencil uh, and create all the artwork um, um, that way so that it had uh, the feel of maybe handmade, but it was completely created digitally. So that was, it was an exciting challenge. I don't know if I needed the extra challenge at the time, but I was really glad after it was done that I, that I took it on and, um, and worked completely digitally this time. Well, thanks so much for participating. The welcomes race fan, uh, welcome race fans a component of the month of May has been really important to us since 2016. And I know that our, that our fans love it, but I also know that uh, the art community loves it. And it's a great way for us to connect to a robust uh, art community uh, here in central Indiana. So thanks for being part. I can't wait to see your, your artwork throughout the month of May, both uh, uh, digitally, we'll see it here. We may see it uh, uh, Indigo, we may see it on the circle. There's a lot of places where people get a chance to interact with, uh, with the artwork that you've created and others. So thanks for spending time with us today, Randy. Thank you. Well, our next artist is Rob Day. Uh, Rob has an illustrious career of all kinds of places where you can see his work. He's got some work uh, permanently on display here in Indiana at the State Museum, uh, as well as work that he's done for the Children's Museum, a whole bunch of not-for-profits. He does commissioned work, really, really talented artist. And Rob, again, you started out as, as an artist who um, did more traditional art, but you've taken a step into the gift uh, for us as well. Talk a little bit about how you came up with your, with your concept and how you connect it to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Motion's important, some of the other things that are connected to your artwork. Yeah, motion's important. Um... Well, the initial idea was to uh, use typography to uh, spotlight the international uh, appeal of the Indianapolis 500. And, um, and the idea evolved into focusing on the word welcome and mm -hmm. welcome race fans. And through animation, transitioning welcome from English into the different languages that are representative of the, the home countries of the drivers who are participating in uh, this year's IndyCar series. Well, I appreciated that that connection. I also appreciated that the use of color for a variety of reasons. You used color uh, to talk about a race for equality and change, but across all spectrums. Uh, but the idea that you were moving from welcome into these other ways of saying welcome and connecting to our uh, to our series uh, was really important. But talk about the color and how you used it, not just the traditional colors, but you also got into the black and white um, checkered flag component, and they both have a different meaning, and it fits into that all-inclusive welcoming uh, that your that your artwork turned to, turned out to be. Yeah, the the, the final design had uh, just a series of uh, checkerboard patterns integrated into the design. Uh, there are uh, like rainbow patterns, black and white checkerboard patterns, as well as different flag designs, and the uh, the well-known rainbow flag was integrated as well. And uh, the use of colors symbolizes just a lot of things, but um, almost most importantly, the movement of the colors and the shape and the transition from uh, shapes and colors was uh, reflective, I thought, of the, the energy at the uh, race day for the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. You know, you talk uh, a little bit when you explained this in the past about how really that we you know, we incorporate all walks of life here. And what mm -hmm. I really liked about your piece was when the Indianapolis 500 first was introduced, it was called an international sweepstakes, even back 110 years ago. And you've captured that here in in that in the way that you've got all the different welcomes. Did you know in your mind that at one point in time we were called the international sweepstakes, or did or, or was it was your connection more the fact that there's so many people who come from around the world to witness as well as compete in it? Well, it, it was after I finished the design that I read where it was called the international sweepstakes very early on, but um, I think that part of the history behind the uh, speedway and the 500 that it's always been uh, an international event with drivers from around the globe participating. 
that was really the, the kind of the driving thing that I, I wanted to create this this GIF and animation about. So, so how did how what kind of what kind of platform did you create this artwork on? Um, it was a combination of uh, uh, Adobe Premiere Pro and Adobe After Effects, and it was it was all a learning process for me. I'd, been learning uh, the digital realm over the last couple of years. So it was, it was really exciting uh, opportunity and challenge to uh, learn how to create this animation. Yeah, but, a, a, that's, that's been one of the fun thing about this is hearing from you all how, you, how you've taken your traditional way of presenting your art and turning it into, into this digital format that we're using this year. So I understand that we have a little bit of a connection through Rolling Stone or a passion for Rolling Stone. Obviously we had Rolling Stones here um, playing for us on July 4th several years ago, but you had an opportunity to connect Rolling Stones to Rolling Stone Magazine. Talk a little bit about how much fun that was uh, to be listed in their magazine as one of the top artists uh, as it relates to music over the last several years. Oh, it was it was so much fun to work uh, on the project and with Rolling Stone. I had, I had subscribed to that magazine since I was a kid, so it was kind of a dream come true to work with them. And um, the entire process was was a lot of fun. So uh, it was, I was so uh, thrilled to be able to have that opportunity. And, and, what, and what kind of artwork did you create for them? Uh, it was an illustration. It was uh, primarily an oil painting and it was finished digitally and sent to them digitally. That's, and that's, it was, uh, yeah, yeah, this is probably a, the fourth or fifth project I'd worked with uh, Rolling Stone on and they were all uh, music related, usually portraits of uh, band different bands that they were reviewing in the record view, review section. That, that's fantastic. Well, we appreciate you taking that talent uh, that you have and, and applying it to Welcome Race fans. I know our fans around the world who come to Indianapolis are going to be excited to see your artwork and for some of them to see Welcome Race fans in their own language. So thanks for participating. I can't wait to, I can't wait to see it around the city and uh, really appreciate you being part of this Welcome Race fans art project. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. I really enjoyed it and um, I uh, look forward to seeing it out out and about in, in Indianapolis. Well, thank you. Thanks. Next, we're getting an opportunity to talk to Sasan, who created maybe one of my favorite pieces of art I've seen in a long time, because it, to me, it connected to me for my love of video games. And it felt like I was seeing a video game um, of the Indianapolis 500 in some sort of future alternate world. Sasan, talk about your artwork, your Welcome Race Fans artwork, and how you came about with this sort of video game feel, a way to welcome fans to Indianapolis and the Indianapolis 500. Uh, sure thing. Um, I've been going to the Indy 500 for a long time, born and raised in Indiana. Um, so I thought it was interesting to kind of tie in my experiences going to the race, to the snake pit, to video games that I grew up playing, um, similar to Mario Kart, and kind of like adapting them into some kind of alternate combined universe. Uh, I had a lot of fun working on this project. Everything that you see actually in the GIF or animation, it was all hand-drawn in VR. Um, so it was a really interesting process for me to some new tricks on my side. Um, so, so when you say it was hand-drawn, how does that work? So you're literally hand-drawn and then how do you upload it and turn it into the GIF that you have? So it's like uh, hard to explain, uh, but it's all hand drawn in virtual reality. So I'm physically drawing with my hands all the shapes and the crowds and the driver and the race car. And so it's all digital, but it has a very physical feel to it. So um, I just had a lot of fun learning how to like design a car in 3D, uh, similar to like something you would see in a video game. So, so I, one of the things I like you have that the car is actually racing on a checkerboard racetrack that has motion and, and up and down. How did, how, how did you design or how did you come up with the idea how the car would look? How did you choose the driver? And then what was your thought behind creating the, uh, the, the racetrack in that checkerboard pattern? Um, the racer and the checkerboard were kind of like the base idea. Uh, I really liked the idea of like a checker flag waving and like having the racer actually drive on that checker flag and have it all warp and follow that design. Um, and then the other elements kind of fit into place. I would have loved to do a lot more with it. 
and see how I could expand upon this like universe that I created, but just trying to condense everything down into um, the time limits that I had for the piece. Um, but I guess uh, creatively coming up with the inspiration for the piece, it is purely based on like uh, just the experience with those early video games being really abstract and minimal with the design of the car and kind of using the medium to its uh, full, <laughs> sorry, um, can't think of the word, just using the medium to the best of its abilities to like capture that character and keep that theme cohesive throughout the whole piece. Right. So, so are, are you a video gamer? Were you a video gamer? Um, and, if, and if so, what did you play and what do you play still? Uh, I am still a gamer. <laughs> right now I'm playing a lot of virtual reality games, um, some racing games on there, which is really fun. Um, uh, but most noteworthy Mario Kart is probably that like racing game that kind of pulled me into racing and got me into like the Indy 500 and seeing how those relationships meet up with each other. Well, I, I appreciate the Mario Kart feel a little bit of, <laughs> of the artwork that you did. When I had an opportunity to show the artwork at home, uh, our senior in high school immediately was was connecting with with your piece just because of that 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 video connection. And I know that a lot of our fans will connect to it and 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 feel that the, the sense of motion and speed, but also that nostalgia that you get when you think about those video games growing up. And there's part of that when you come to the Indy 500. Uh, there's that nostalgia of remembering the first time you came and sort of like Randy's artwork, remembering the first car that you saw and how things have evolved uh, over time. So Sasan, I really appreciate you taking the time. I really appreciate the effort here. There's going to be a certain segment of our fans that are going to be really drawn to your gift and, and what it means to them. Uh, but thanks so much and look forward to seeing you back out here for another Indianapolis 500. Sorry, no snake pit this year, but uh, we'll bring that back next year. And our last guest on Behind the Bricks and our welcome race fan artist get a chance here to talk to Madison Watson. Um, Madison, thank you for joining us. I just want to say you're unique in the sense that you combine three cities that sort of connect to the Indianapolis 500. You lived in Long Beach. One of our best races in the NTT IndyCar series is in Long Beach. You lived in Pasadena which is uh, known for a really a little parade that's maybe a tick bigger than the 500 festival parade. <laughs> and then you um, live here uh, in Indianapolis as well. So I, I love the thought that when you put your mind to this artwork uh, that you created some, you may, maybe you didn't know that Long Beach and Pasadena influenced it, but it feels to me like you were completely well-rounded when you came together. And it wasn't just about Indianapolis, but maybe about those other experiences in big event cities. Uh, like this when you were creating your welcome fan uh, welcome uh, fan artwork. Yes, of course. So yes, like you said, I have lived in Long Beach and Pasadena and the small parade you're talking about is that Rose Bowl parade, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, so yes, I try to bring in all my experiences with all my pieces of art, whether that be commission or things like this, where I, I want to draw them from my experiences to make other people see what I see through my lens as well. So what I really like about you as well is so you've had a passion for art for a long time, but you really haven't just really haven't focused on being an artist full time until in the last year. And one of the things that I read about you that, that I really appreciate, because I think we all need more of this, is just that ability to say to yourself, I am good enough. I'm passionate about this and I am good enough. I'm going to I'm going to step out of my comfort zone uh, and try and make a living as an artist. When did you really realize that you are good enough and you made that transition from just doing it sort of as a hobby to making it what you want to do full time? So actually, um, it happened around January in 2020 before I knew about the pandemic. Of course, it was there. But of course, I knew about the pandemic. Um, I had been getting a lot of people telling me, you're really good. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm, and I just constantly compared myself to other artists. And I'm like, well, I am pretty good. So then I started taking myself pretty pretty seriously last year around January and people started reaching out to me for art pieces of their own. I was like, okay, well, at least I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> so I basically turned my hobby into a business. I'm um, not a full fledged business because I still want to keep that fun aspect of a part of it. But yeah, last year around January is when I would say I was reborn into that artist. <laughs> well, that, that's when I, when I was reading about you, that was one of the things that it made me smile. And I'm excited that, that you use maybe our platform a little bit to let others know that you are an artist and you can do amazing work. You captured one of the more 
special moments of an Indy 500 every year, which is that moment when the wreath and the milk is handed, the wreath put on the driver and the milk's handed to that driver. When you were thinking that through, um, what made you focus on those two particular elements? Oh, because we're winners in Indianapolis, <laughs> of course. And I wanted to show that the fun, exciting aspect, you can feel the driver being excited about it. You can see the milk being poured and things like that. We're winners in Indianapolis. I wanted to show that winning aspect and make and everybody else see it as well. I also like the fact that you, you didn't place the winner in the traditional victory circle. You really placed the winner and maybe you didn't mean to do this, but you placed a winner, which looks to me like in turn one with the car there in turn one with the fans behind it. Yep. And it was in, in my mind, it's a really unique way to have thanked the fans or that moment is not just important to the driver, but it's important to all of us that come to the Indy 500 and watch it that moment. And it felt to me like you took that moment and, and were handing it to the crowd. Yes, exactly. Which is why I wanted to make sure I, I focused the crowd on in the back as well, because of course, it's the winner. Is the it's the driver winning? Of course, but the crowd is there and they feel that win as well, which is why I wanted to make sure all aspects were a part of that win. And the it car, the did... reef, the milk, the fans, all that, all part of the win. Absolutely, and you got the checkered flag in there, which was awesome. Um, so, what medium did you use uh, to create your art? Um, I used the app Procreate um, to create that gift for uh, the project. So is that is that a medium you're used to working in or were you also kind of learning it as you went through for this project? So Procreate is what I use most most of the time. Um, I do other mediums as well. I do um, textiles and uh, sometimes I paint as well with acrylic, but a Procreate is what I'm most comfortable with. Now, creating a GIF is a story within its own. Um, it's been it was a learning experience for me along the way as well, um, as well as some other artists I've heard. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And it was really fun to do. Well, we appreciate you being part of it. Uh, we appreciate you capturing those special moments that are special not only to the drivers, but but to our fans. It really does uh, make part of the reason people come to the Indy 500 and, and uh, really appreciate the artwork. Thanks for joining us. Looking forward to seeing your artwork around the city and, and looking forward to uh, watching your career as you uh, maybe go from sort of being a part-time professional artist into a full-time professional artist. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So that was fun to spend some time with those four artists and talk about how they came up with the concepts for Welcome Race fans and the mediums they used as they tried to take their traditional way of presenting art and turning it into a GIF. We also have a fifth artist who couldn't join us today, Petronio Bendito, uh, who did a piece of art as well that shows a lot of motion in it. Uh, he teaches up at Purdue University and unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but we are excited about the way he's taking computer uh, generated graphics, and he's worked through some algorithms, a lot of stuff that's much smarter than I am. That's why he's at Purdue. Uh, but it's another uh, piece that I think you'll enjoy seeing with the colors and the motion around Welcome Race fans using his uh, computer skills uh, really to do that. So that piece of art will be seen around him. And unfortunately, we're missing him today. As I said, he uh, teaches at Purdue University. So as you can see, a lot of talented artists uh, in Indianapolis that are in the Indianapolis area that are continuing a tradition that we started in 2016 of celebrating those artists and connecting them to that famous phrase, welcome race fans here in the city of Indianapolis. As we lead into May and we talk about the history and tradition of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the Indianapolis 500, you know, tradition never stops around here. We thought it'd be fun to ask some of our race car drivers, the NTT IndyCar Series race car drivers who'll be trying to win the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500 right behind me uh, going into turn one and across those yard of bricks. Uh, this year and ask them how much they really understood about our history and tradition and a lot of the anniversaries that we get to celebrate this year. Take a listen. Let's see how well they do. Oh, I know this. 1911, Ray Haroon. Uh, 1911, Ray Haroon. Is Louis Meyer a baseball player? <laughs> Is Louis, Louis... Louis Myers a driver? 1911 Ray Haroon. No, Louis Meyer was the milk guy. The first guy to win the Indy 500 was in 1918, right? The first Indianapolis 500 mile motor race was in 1911, won by Ray Haroon in the number 32 Marmon Wasp. I don't have a clue. Let's say 1947. Man, I don't know any of these. I'm gonna say the 
The board warner? It must have been right. Wasn't it right from the... 34. Six. Was that, I was going to say six. Did you see me? I started to go s four. Oh, man. Because Ray Haroon's on it. So it must have been... 104 years ago, maybe maybe we didn't have the Borg Warner trophy though back then, did we? So maybe like the 40s? I don't know, that's a total guess. I have no idea. All right, okay. Louis Meyer. Oh, so Louis Meyer, I believe, started the milk tradition because he asked for a nice cold glass of buttermilk after an especially hot and hard and grueling Indy 500. Uh, I don't know. It was, um, uh, oh, God, not the guy. Can't believe I'm forgetting. And it, uh, Louis Ma? It was, um, I know it. Uh, Wil Wilbur Shaw, or no, Louis Meyer. Uh, God, what's the guy's name? Oh, Meyer, Louis Meyer. One point for Alex, all right. Well, there you have it, race fans, another episode of Behind the Bricks. Another one that was a lot of fun. It's always good when we get to talk to people who are taking the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and welcome race fans and creating their own version of what that means. So it was fun to talk to the artists who created the artwork you'll see around Indianapolis and you'll see it in our program this year. It's been a fun tradition that we started in 2016 connecting to our arts community. I thank the Indianapolis Arts Council for partnering with us on that. And then history and tradition is important here at the Speedway because traditions never stop. And we got to see how much fun it was for those NTT IndyCar Series drivers who are really great at race car driving to figure out how good they were at traditions and understanding the history of the Indianapolis 500. Look forward to seeing you all here in just a few days at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as we head into the GMR Grand Prix and then the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500 presented by Gamebridge just over my shoulder on the track at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Thanks, race fans. We'll see you soon.